The Barroom Network presents two fired up Bears fans. They are ready to rumble on the Bear Debate. This is David Kaplan from the Cap J Hood Show on ESPN 1000 and NBC Sports Chicago. Now get ready to listen and watch the Bulls 101 with Chris and Laro. Take that, Sparkles. What's up, Bulls fans? Chris Amundsen and Laro Golden with Bulls 101 here after the Philadelphia Bulls game tonight, which was a disappointing loss, to say the least. But um, we're in the midst of a stretch right now that's going to be pretty tough all of November with lots of different playoff teams. But uh, we've got we've got two really special guests tonight that I'm really excited to finally have on the show. Uh, but before we, we introduce them, I just wanted to see how you're doing, Larry. Uh, how's, how was it to watch that game? And, and, you know, I, I, I feel like, I feel like my emotions are higher and lower than yours. You're, you're kind of the steady, the steady anchor here. So uh, how are you feeling after that game? Um, well, uh, obviously I can't be too good, but honestly, <laughs> uh, <laughs> honestly, the defense is to me, uh, less is, the, is the lesser of the problem. The, uh, I guess if you look at the, the the team coming into the year, right, you would say, I think the offense is going to be elite and the defense will just have to see where it's at. But it's been like totally opposite. Um, the defense has been pretty damn good, honestly. And um, got to get better at contestant threes and rotating, um, doing those things more consistently. But um, offensively is where I think they have to get better. Um, so honestly, we're six and three. Can't really get too down, but uh, you would like to see some improvement on the offensive end. Yeah, for sure. As everyone expected, obviously, elite defensive <laughs> team and middling, uh, middling offensive team. So t- we want to welcome in our two guests tonight. They are the co-hosts of Cash Considerations, which is one of my absolute favorite. Not only the name of the podcast and and the reason why it came about is always just dear to my heart, but. Um, just a great podcast in general. So I first want to welcome on Jason Pat. He is an editor at Clutch Points App, contributor at uh, Bloggable, our favorite blogging site from SB Nation for the Bulls, Forbes. And uh, the first half, one, one of the halves, I'm not sure, the first or second half 
of cash consideration. So Jason Pat, welcome on the show, buddy. How you doing? Thanks for joining us this late. I'm doing all right. Uh, obviously a little bummed out about the outcome tonight, but thank you for having me. And so we've been trying to make this happen and we get, we had you guys on a while ago and we've been trying to return the favor by coming on your show. It's so ex exciting to make this, make it finally happen. Uh, unfortunately, obviously, uh, on the circumstances, not the best with another loss of the Sixers tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then add in the other half to uh, of cash considerations, Ricky O'Donnell, you guys know him. Uh, he works for SB Nation and is, you know, one of the most prominent voices in Bull Twitter and famously, I think, got John Paxson to fire himself. So, Ricky O'Donnell, welcome to the show, buddy. How you doing? I can't take credit for that. It was it was everyone. It was a group effort. Team effort. I, you know, I got a little bit of a platform, so I used it to the best of my abilities to tell John Paxson he sucks and you should quit. <laughs> and because of that, we have a pretty fun team this year. But for the first time this season, the Bulls have hit some adversity. So I feel like uh, it's fitting timing for us being on the show because Jason and I, since we've been podcasting about the Bulls, all we do is complain about them. We've never had <laughs> we've had like two happy podcast episodes in four years. So uh, it feels fitting to come on your podcast after back to back losses. That, that's what I was saying. I said it's, it's so nice of the Bulls to give a fitting tribute to cash considerations, <laughs> be, you know, humble beginnings, uh, and have us be able to to complain about the Bulls a little bit. Hopefully, we don't have to do too much complaining. But there are definitely, as you mentioned, Ricky, uh, we've hit some adversity in there. And when you do hit adversity, the the glaring weaknesses become more glaring, and the strengths, you know, sometimes get get mitigated a little bit. So we're, we're happy to get into get into it with you guys tonight, but. Um, just wanted to get your, your thoughts. I, I know you said it was kind of a disappointing loss, but I want to start Laro with you about, I mean, the, the, the Sixers were missing, I think I tweeted out $88 million. I wanted to see like how much of their, of their $144 million roster were they missing tonight? And it was more than half, uh, in, in actual money, but the Sixers have been number one in offense all season and, uh, if Furkan Korkmaz continues on like he is, I think he's going to be a top MVP candidate going <laughs> forward. But uh, how do you? What do you? What do you think about this Sixers squad, Larry? Um, obviously they're missing some big, big names. You know, uh, I won't say the one Australian guy, but uh, <laughs> but <right. laughs> that guy. <laughs> but they're they're they're. Um, I think one of the things that uh, coming into the to both these games that we may, maybe just me. Uh, I kind of, I don't know, took for granted is like that team has been together for the most part for a while. So, you know, it's not too many different things that Doc has to work through. Like these, they, they've been through a battle in playoffs multiple times. And a lot of these guys know what, what, what they need to do. Um, they know how to play around uh, Joel. They know how to play off of them. Joel know how, know where's, knows where to find guys. And um, I think that is something that you can't really uh, – forget about or take for granted. I think that goes a long way when you have the chemistry and you know uh, how to play with each other. And I think we're seeing that with the Bulls where we say, oh man, we got three absolute studs on the offensive side of the ball. But I mean, you, they're still learning how to play with each other. Uh, so that it's going to take a while. But in terms of the Sixers, I, I, I think, man, if they get back to you know, if they get back some of these guys that they're missing, man, um, that's a tough team. I think they're going to be a, a very tough team. But Corkmaz, I mean, come on. I mean, I mean, what was that one three hit over? What was it? Caruso with his hand right in his face. He just just pulled just it. Throwing up junk, man. Just, I mean, <laughs> I feel like it's been that way every team we play, though. Like, I feel like every team we we come across, like they just shoot lights out, and, and it's just I don't it's know, like man. The the JJ Barea <laughs> All Stars, you yeah. know, against the Bulls. <laughs> like, you guys remember those that heyday of JJ Barea? Every time we faced. JJ Bray, he just he played like Bulls an killer. <laughs> I mean, Bulls wasn't killer. Matisse in the first game? Matisse was knocking down three balls, if I yeah, remember. I mean, right. the so first like, game he had one. Isaiah Joe hit one in that first game. Obviously, <laughs> George Nyang had whatever he did in that first game, and then he George Nyang had the the one at the end of the shot clock in this game tonight, where he just threw it up, and he didn't even have a good game today. But like, yeah, uh, he, the one at the end of the clock where he just threw, like there was that little stretch there where. Seth Curry had that and one where he literally just like was on his like knees, threw the ball up and went in. <laughs> Nyang, like a That's few crazy. seconds later, chucks the shot at the end of the shot clock, goes in. It's just like, oh my God. I mean, they, and just the shooting, obviously, just yeah. like, I feel like a yeah. clear difference between these two teams right now. Their shooting depth 
when they have Cork Maz hitting seven threes. Uh, Niang has been huge off the bench for them. And the Bulls just don't have much shooting right now with Zach struggling for three with Vooch being awful. Uh, what were they, like 7 to 28, 7 to 29 tonight, I think. And the other night, they only hit six. I mean, and they're the, uh, in terms of attempts and makes, they're last in the league. And it's definitely a problem for them right now. And that's why the Sixers, a bit, they're, they're, you said top offense in the NBA, because they got guys just making it rain. Seth is shooting like over 60% this year. Cork Maz, Nyang, these guys have been awesome. So they're missing guys, but all their role guys just hitting huge shots. And like down the stretch when Cork Maz, Nyang, and then obviously MB hit a couple threes too. It's like just hitting daggers. It's just it's good brutal. night, man. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to ask you, Ricky, about, about that continuity. The, the Sixers have it. And even though they were down like a third of their, their roster today, they've got guys that have been there that have, that have been in the trenches with those guys. Our team, only three guys – from last year's you know starting night roster are even on the the roster now and Patrick Williams is obviously out for the season and Kobe isn't even out yet so it's basically Zach and like 13 new guys so uh, do you think that continuity is is affecting us on uh, on on both ends I think it's possible yeah I would say that like uh you could look at all the possessions that end in Caruso or Lonzo picking rolls or isolations that just don't end up going anywhere like, if re- redistributing those possessions to DeRozan or to Zach or to do something else, uh, I think, like, could you point to the lack of continuity for that? Perhaps. I think for sure. Uh, more than anything, I feel like Vucevic is such a critical piece to their offensive flow. Like, at the yeah. start of the season, I remember Donovan saying, like, we run a lot of two-man actions with either Zach and Vooch or DeMar and Vooch. And it just seems like... Uh, when he's in the game, he's getting so many touches. Uh, he's doing a lot of dribble handoffs. His usage rate isn't too high, but you saw today, I think he took like 16 field goal attempts. He's been getting up a lot of shots. So having him struggle so much, I just feel like uh, he's such a critical piece to what they want to do offensively. And he's penciled in to be a high volume scorer for them. And so when he's struggling as much as he is, I think you know it was a 45 true shooting percentage coming into tonight. Uh, that really that really knocks you down. Now I do think that coming into this game, the Bulls were what like ninth in offensive efficiency. Is that right? Yeah, they're still tenth so right now, even after tonight's tied. Their free throws so, are huge. Yeah, in the last couple games, it's uh, it's been poor offense. I think more than anything else, there is still a lot to like defensively. I think, but tonight, man, we just ran into a superstar. Like the Bulls got some good players, right? They got three All Stars. What they don't have is a superstar. And Joel Embiid's a superstar. And you could see on that last dagger three he hit. I mean, the game might have been over before he even hit that shot. But that's a seven-foot-two dude skipping back into a step-back three to ice the game like that. He had a few of them today. He was, he was awesome yeah. in this game. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes you just got to tip your cap to him. The Bulls got a lot of problems that are ailing them. But uh, Embiid was the best player on the floor tonight. And it was a true superstar performance from him, I thought. Well, you know, I'm looking at the, some of the stats here as well. And one of the things that is jumping out at me is the bench points. And you're looking at 27 from the Bulls and the Sixers got 40. Uh, and obviously, you know, Furcon helped that out. But like some of the things that like worry me um, is the bench when when you when you look at it. Right. Um, you know, you take this game out of it, out of the equation because of Furcon. Uh, but, um, like, I just worry, like, when – is Kobe – I wonder how this this bench will look when Kobe gets back because I think, you know, I looked at some of the lineups and DeMar's out there carrying the load, but, like, you know, you, you drive and you kick to, you know, DJJ for three. Like, I, like there's just – there's just – I just feel like there aren't uh, a lot of um, guys on the bench that can just get a bucket other than, like, when DeMar's out there with the guys – um, and I think I hope that when Kobe comes back, like that, that'll change a bit because I do feel like getting having some more scoring off that bench would help this team some more. Um, but how do you guys feel about that situation? Yeah, I mean, dead last in three point attempts per game, mm-hmm. three point rate. I assume they're dead last as well. Uh, the one thing Kobe can do is get up shots, right? Yeah. And so I think he's going to be stepping into a great position with the team. The one thing I worry about is just that injury is tough to come back from, right? Yeah. Like, does he have to be playing himself into shape for the first month? What is he going to look like right when he comes back on the court? But 
I think he fits pretty well next to all their other guards, right? Like, uh, I think he fits well next to Lonzo and Caruso. I think he fits well next to Io. Just having someone with a quick trigger from three for a team that really struggles to get up shots from distance, yeah. uh, I think it's going to be a big boost to them. It will be interesting to see what Donovan does with the rotation when he comes back. Like, who's yeah. playing time is really getting cut. How much less Io are we going to see? I think in in some ways, Io has been – He's been pretty good as a as an energy guy off the bench, but maybe you need more skill in that spot. So I'm excited for Kobe to come back. It seems like uh, they finally put him in a position to succeed. Last year, it really felt like he was set up to fail. Yeah. This year, it feels like he's set up to succeed. So Kobe, third year, bro, you were the number seven pick in the draft. Like, let's see it this year. I'm really excited for him. But, uh, you know, it's a tough injury, too. Yeah. I mean, he's going to have only, yeah, like, one job. Literally, Kobe come in and just chuck threes. That's, like, all I want him to do. Like, obviously, he, he could do a little other stuff. But, like, with the fact that they're just shooting so few threes, like, he's just got to get them up. Because I think they're I think they're passing up some good looks from three as well. Yeah. They're taking, whatever, 20. I think they're at 26 a game I was just looking at. It's just not enough uh, in this NBA. Like, I don't need him shooting 43s a game. But get me around 30. They're, the the rate that the, their percentage makes have not been good the last couple of games, but they're still, I think, at like 35, 36. So, like, if you at least get up a few more, Kobe will definitely help there. Just, is the bench, like, it's, it is weird, though, because, like, DJJ and, like, Bradley have been, like, I feel like they've sparked runs, but they just, they just like, they just don't have the offensive juice, like like you said. Like, when you have DeMar playing with like, Caruso, Io, Bradley, like, DJJ, it's just, like, <laughs> you can't you, he kicks out like no one you don't trust any of those guys to make a shot and like i like i've as like illinois guy i love io and like he had the awesome celtics game he's come back down to earth the last couple nights i think he was what one of five one of six tonight missed a three or two he just can't rely on his offense so i i, I also agree just that like and i even said it going back to like the knicks game it's like when they when they were struggling most of that game like just the knicks have Derek Rose and like all these guys off the bench who can just get up shots, who can score, and the Bulls just like have just don't really have much of that there. Yeah. So I think Kobe will definitely be huge there. Hope you don't lose the defense because obviously that that group is good like energy defense wise, and they use yeah. that to turn defense into offense. But I think they can also be great if at least if Kobe at least plays passable defense, if they can force turnovers, hit Kobe for open transition threes, like that could definitely just hu- hopefully be a huge boost for their offense. It is crazy, like Ricky, you said that. That they're still like a top ten offense, it just feels like they've been so much worse. <laughs> uh, I know, like I said, I mentioned the free throws. They're shooting like eighty six percent on free throws this year, and they their like free throw rate is pretty high. And like Demar has been awesome there, and just yeah. and awesome in general. It just it just definitely feels like the three point shooting is a huge problem. The offense has been had been bad, and they're still like top ten. So like. And it's just been kind of weird. They've been kind of a weird team so far. And even uh, though they're, they're a six and three, at least. Three point percentage, they're fourth in the league. Right. I think yeah, that was 36%. I think. Yeah. So uh, to me, it just yeah. it feels like they're just leaving all this low hanging fruit there, right? Like, yeah. you got to, and we talked about this I think, a little bit before the show, but, and you guys both mentioned this the distribution or like Lonzo and Caruso having open threes. And then instead of taking that three, they kind of record scratch and then try and drive and make something out of it. And they're just not generating as good looks. Lonzo had a, a three on the wing tonight that was wide open. He pump faked, he drove towards the rim and then he hit DJJ in, in the, on the, on the, on the other corner for a three. It's like you traded an open three from a 40% shooter to an open three for Derek Jones Jr. Who's like 20s <laughs> nine or whatever it is from three. So it's around there, yeah. they, they have the, they're, and they're, a lot of those possessions end in DeMar standing in the corner doing nothing. Like if DeMar's on the floor and the ball is not in his hands to create and get the defense in rotation, what are you doing? Like he's, he's got to be the start to your offense because he has been, he has been absolute money all year long with the ball in his hands. Very low turnovers. He gets the free throw line. He kicks out the shooters. But as you guys mentioned, if your shooters are the ones kicking out, who are you kicking out to? (laughs) You're kicking out to guys who are not shooters. So put the ball in DeMar's hand in my opinion, who isn't a shooter and kick out to Lonzo, kick out to Crusoe, kick out to Zach. I, I think especially that's low hanging fruit. Yeah. Especially with Zach struggling with the hand as well. I mean, Zach, Zach is like putting up like pretty good numbers, but uh, I, he, he still, just, I feel like just doesn't look like himself. Obviously he's not shooting as yeah. well, but I think he's taking, he's for, I think he's like forcing up some shots for sure. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, he's still like his numbers are still pretty dang good. But I was just looking at some on-off stuff, and I know obviously early season caveats. 
Bulls offensive rating with Zach right now is 104 in his like 300 plus minutes. That's awful. Like he's usually like raises their offense and he's not doing that, even though his numbers are, are pretty good. I think some of that is just like, he just like, hasn't like, it hasn't been great. Like in the flow of the offense, he's a lot of, it's just like, he'll drive and his like just natural ability. He can score, but they're just like, the team is just like not playing well with him. And he's not raising the level of the team. Cause I think I, I don't want to hate on him too much because the thumb is clearly bothering him. His shooting, his three point shooting is down. Uh, so I think it could be nice to maybe take some of that burden off him and just have him spot up, and maybe that could help that percentage a bit. Yeah, yeah. You wonder like, Drozen's not going to average twenty seven a game this year. Right? He's like, and he's like fifty percent shooting right now. Like, like to this come point, down. the reason they're six and three is because they've played some weak teams, and Drozen's been playing totally out of his mind. Uh, I think the worry is, like, what happens when DeRozan starts to regress a little bit? Like, if he's not shooting... I guess he's, like, even right now, a tick below 60% true shooting. I know true shooting in general for the league is down, but, like... uh, So he's not, like, insanely unsustainable, but he's just been so good so far. So uh, they're going to need to switch up their offense a little more. I totally agree. I think that... Uh, DeRozan's playmaking, we haven't fully seen it unlocked yet since he's been on the Bulls. Like, that was his no. calling card in San Antonio. I believe Vooch is leading the team in assists right now for the Bulls. And uh, to me, that's just because Vooch is involved in so many of the actions. So, yep. you know, you wonder is Vooch going to break out of the slump? I hate to harp on it too much, but I mean, at this point, it's got to be the biggest storyline on the team. I mean, right? Vooch's individual <laughs> offensive struggles and, yeah. uh, it's just tough when you're taking, you know, 16 shots a game or whatever it is. I know he's, t- he's taking like 20 shots per 100 possessions, and he's like third on the team in that. He's just basically yeah. behind DeRozan and Levine. But, uh, yeah, it has been weighing down the offense, I think, lately. you got to ask yourself, what would the offense – Lara, like what would the offense look like if Vuce was just making – like not shooting 40%? <laughs> From the rim, mm-hmm. like at the rim, like forty-five yeah, percent. Because he's not doing anything wrong. It's crazy. just clearly he's just he's just he's breaking off. shots. He's getting yeah. good looks. Like I don't yeah. like. Yeah. I don't hate the shots he's taking. He's just missing them. No, it's crazy. And, and he's crazy because teams are still like he's still getting some closeouts and things like that. But anyway, no. The thing is, like, I was just talking to Chris before uh, before you guys came on. I showed a couple of plays, and I'm like, why is Demar in a corner? Like I I don't. DeMar DeRozan should not be in a corner in horns. He should either be a screener or he should be the ball handler. Like I, I, I don't, I don't. And I, again, like you just said, you don't want to harp on, on, on Zach or, or I'm sorry, um, on Vooch, but I don't, I don't want to harp on Billy because I, I do feel like he's trying to empower his players and allow them to have, have their own like flow in, in the game. But I, I kind of just want him to kind of, and again, I may be off base. Like I said before, but uh, like I, I kind of want him to put his foot down and be like, look, hey, Demar, I want Demar to handle the ball a little bit more. You know, I I I just feel like the offense flows a lot better. He continues to collapse the defenses, and even if let's say he's missing his 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 mid ranges and things like that, like he's still good enough being able to get downhill, collapse a defense, draw help, and find shooters. Like that stuff, I. I we need to be. We need it more. If, if we're not going to run a cohesive offense, uh, uh, screening, split screens, all these different types of things uh, to to make this offense go, and we're just going to dribble handoff, empty side pick and roll, dribble handoff, you know, high pick and roll. Like if we're just going to do that, then just give the ball to DDR and let, and run those same things, and you probably will get better shots. You'll probably you'll probably find better shots. Um, and I just wish that that's what would happen. Um, but I don't know, maybe he's trying to, you know, let Lonzo, you know, get, get I don't know, you know, cause, <laughs> you know, that was like a thing before the season, like, yeah, is Lonzo going to get mad? Yeah. If, you know what I'm saying? So I don't know if that is what's going on, but man, I need to see more DDR and ball, man. Yep. Well, if, if you see like anytime Lonzo is involved in the pick and roll and they let him start diving towards the rim, like nothing... I think uh, I think uh, Chip Jones on on Twitter had this. He said it was like fifty percent of those possessions end in nothing. Like nothing is created <laughs> out of those fifty percent. And so it's not and it's not a, a knock against Lonzo. Like, but if the possession ends in a in a Lonzo like floater in the lane, 
and you have DeMar in the corner, I just think you've done it's something bad. fundamentally <laughs> wrong. Like it's just, yeah. that's just not, I was <laughs> I made a terrible, terrible analogy to Laro that I'm not going to repeat. But it's like, <laughs> if you're trying to bake a cake and you've got flour and you're like looking for substitutes for flour, like, what are you doing? Like, just use the flour to make, if you're, you've got the ingredients to make a great cake. Just make the cake. Like, yeah. I think, like, why are you putting the bar in a corner? <laughs> right. I think you're dead on. I think that Lonzo's limitations have shown is a half court ball handler, yes. but what Lonzo's to me, Lonzo has mostly played up to a scouting report. I feel like. yeah, yeah, absolutely. He's, really, He's really been what I expected game. for sure. His defense has been phenomenal. I've been particularly impressed with how he guards bigger players. Yeah. Uh, offensively, he's shooting about 40% from three still, right? He's taking like he's over six threes a game. <laughs> Up that volume, make him more of an off-ball gunner is their best avenue towards improving the low-hanging fruit on the offense right now, which is the lack of three-point attempts. And like Chris said, like Caruso and Lonzo are limited offensive players. The fact that they're so... The fact, like, they're still positive impact players. That's a testament to how yes. strong they are in other aspects of the game. If you're a guard and you're, like, a nominal point guard, as both of those guys are, the one thing you should be able to do is break guys down off the dribble, get to the hoop, uh, be able to survey the floor, make a pass, or get to the foul line. So both of those guys, Lonzo in particular, is just never getting to the foul line. And you know the Netflix show, The Floor is Lava? I feel like that's Lonzo. <laughs> I guess. He's I'll afraid that. of the rim. The restricted area when Lonzo you, has the ball. Do you think that it has to do with like, like Lonzo really needs to be a two foot jumper to really explode at the rim? And like, obviously, it's not too many situations where you can just, you know, two foot jump. Like, you got to be more of a strider. And I, that, that's probably Love one it, of the yeah. reasons. Yeah. Love it. So, yeah, not quick off the ground. Yeah. Uh, but like, this is just, this is Lonzo ball. Right, like yeah, 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 yeah. we knew it. We did, we this knew that was his issues coming in. Like so, I was like, yeah, like it's frustrating. Obviously, when he, when he'll like beats, well, and like he'll have the advantage in like a pick and roll, and then he either thrives, tries to throw a bad pass, or he takes that mid range shot, which I think he's made like maybe one. He made one tonight, but he's made like one or two, and you, like you said, it usually just like goes nowhere. And like I, Lonzo taking like step back mid range shots in pick and roll is awful. Uh, and yeah. like I said, he never he never gets all the way to the rim because uh, he's allergic to the rim. But like uh, we knew that, like he that's a, that, well, we knew he, he like, doesn't have to. We right. don't need him to do that. That's right. that's the problem yeah. is we're trying to force him into that role. We don't need him to fulfill that role. He had he had great moments today when they were trying to come back when he would the transition stuff when they would yes, get the yes. ball and he would push whether it was a make or a miss they'd push and like him and Derek Jones Jr. Uh, were both just like super aggressive getting the ball yeah. up the court and we we saw I think them hook up for a couple plays in transition and uh, Jerry Jones Jr. off off of his rebounds as well. And that's where Alonzo is awesome. We, which again, we knew that transition, like that's where he is best, not pick and roll half court offense. So definitely. And I, I would like to see him just be more off ball and shoot more threes. I think he took yes. what, eight po- over eight a game last year. And he's at like six, something this year, Give me eight, especially on this team, shoot yeah. nine or 10 threes shoot a more. game. Alonzo. Yes. Like he, yes. he has two or three attempts easy that he could have taken tonight. He's yeah. open for two or yeah. three times. Just get him up. Get him up Get him instead up. of – Who cares? Miss shots. him? Who cares? I would I think rather he only had take five tonight, right? He only had shot yeah, five tonight? Two, yeah. two of five. I think, yeah. yeah. And he's yeah. averaging they need six more. or they, they, just, they just need to get more three-pointers. Stuff. Like, again, we don't – they don't need to be chucking like 50 a game, but yeah. 25 a game is off, It's yeah. just terrible. I just It's just hard to have a ton of yeah. offensive success like that. You're running into a math problem when you're yeah. only taking 25 threes a game. Right. So that's kind of like one baseline of like in this league – your three point rate has to be like at a certain level for you to even compete. Like, especially last year, it felt so overwhelming. I think maybe the Jazz had like the second or third highest three point rate ever. The highest, I believe, is still that really good Rockets team that went to the uh, Western Conference Finals during the peak Harden D'Antoni years. But yeah, you got to be able to get up enough threes. Otherwise, you're just immediately putting yourself in a huge hole. Yeah. So I think that is a. The biggest, yeah, that's a huge problem with the team right now. In addition to Vooch's struggles, like uh, not running through DeRozan enough and just not getting enough threes. Yeah. Well, and and you guys mentioned um, the imbalance with the bench, right? You've got these guys who are really defensive stalwart guys, like Io, Troy Brown Jr., um, Derek Jones Jr., Caruso. Like they're all really, and Tony Bradley's been 
really, really good since he started yes, yeah. uh, going in the rotation. Like he's been phenomenal. Like he's done exactly what he needs. He's the best net rate, like plus minus or net rating on the team. Right? Something like that. <laughs> I know but it's the distribution sizes, but like yeah, uh, yeah. But the but the lineups have left a little bit something to be desired, and I think Kobe is going to solve a lot of that when he comes back because I think he's going to take some of those IO minutes. Um, Probably. But there's, I wanted to ask you guys about Javante Green in the starting lineup and yeah. whether you not whether or not you think that's something that should go forward because I, I think with the rim protection and the lob threat that Derek Jones has been. I think he may be a good candidate to swap out with Javante Green and Javante Green's been really I mean. Like to ask him to be this offensive is. person, like he is, yeah, like he's doing exactly what we thought he would do. But I wonder if his minutes and his role should kind of diminish as Kobe comes back and Derek Jones should be taking, you know, a little bit more time at the four and maybe starting with at the four to try and get these guys off to better starts. Because if Vooch is, if Vooch continues a shooting slump and Javante's out there, you're playing three on five on offense to, to start the first quarter, and you're not going to get out to good spot, to good shots um, and good starts that way. But what do you guys think about that? I was saying it while I was watching the game tonight that Derek Jones Jr. should be in the starting lineup, and then Stacy said it like shortly after that. So I think a lot of people were thinking the same thing watching that game. So Javante, he's like one of the most unlikely NBA players in the entire league. He went to Radford. He was in like multiple low-level European stops. At no point since he's like entered the NBA has he been expected to be a starter, right? Yeah. He looked really good in the preseason while Pat was hurt. He's been starting for Pat for a few times. Coming into the year, coming into camp, I did not figure Javante would even be in the rotation. Now, I love what Javante's given him, but it's tough to look at someone in Javante's position and be like, this guy's letting us down. I think he's given you about all he can give you for what his skill set is. Jones and Green have very similar skill sets, right? Like they're both sort of undersized fours with, you know, obviously extreme athleticism. Jones's credential speaks for itself in terms of the dunk contest, but Javante Green has like one to three insanely athletic plays every single game. We saw it again tonight with an alley-oop. So I think you could slide Jones into Green's role, and they're playing the same role, right? They're providing some supplemental – rim protection on the baseline they're playing Vooch a little bit higher and Bradley a little bit higher to uh, fend off drives protect the paint and they want athletic wings to try to challenge shots along the baseline and Jones is a natural fit for that Uh, Jones has also been just like a way more established NBA player in his career coming into this season before green so the only reason Jones sort of fell out of favor early in the season I think is because he had the injury in preseason now that didn't stop Billy from immediately playing Pat but for whatever reason, Jones didn't start playing until Pat got hurt or maybe like the game he got hurt. So, you know, late, he, he wasn't playing yeah. in the very early part of the season. So I think Derrick Jones has been awesome. I love what Jones and Bradley have both been able to provide. Obviously, Jones is going to be limited as a shooter, so he's not going to fix your three-point rate problem. But for someone who does fill a very similar role as Javante, I just think he's better. So I would still have Javante playing. I know Javante's not playing like huge minutes Just now, swap the roles, basically. Start Jones, yeah, and uh, go Javante. Or, I mean, the other thing you could do is start Caruso. Yeah, yep. yes. Uh, yep. And Caruso, you know, this was – we got to shout him out every time we talk about the Bulls. Steph No mentioned it in our little group text. He's like, yeah, they should start Caruso because they're getting off to slow starts. A really good defensive player should be guarding the best players on the other team, which are the starters. So – that totally makes sense to me, too. I like the idea of keeping Caruso on the bench as sort of like a change of pace to what teams are – like he immediately makes the opposing team unsettled when he comes in because his defense is so uh, energetic and on point and physical. But that's another idea they could do. Certainly the slow starts have been a problem. And they were a slow, they were a slow starting team like before these last two games, too. Even yeah. when they were six, you know, six and one – before the Celtics game, even like they yeah. had just been getting off to slow starts. So uh, it will be interesting to see if Billy or perhaps more importantly, Karnaschovas does something to address it. If you know, they're going to make another in-season move. Yeah, They definitely, they talked about the slow start thing today. I know Zach, I think talked about it. Uh, and it's like, it is like, it is hard to be like Javante is the problem. This was like, I was, Vooch has been <laughs> awful. And Zach, Zach has been a culprit of the slow starts. He's had a few games where he's like really easing into these games. And I don't want to rip on it, Zach too much. I obviously was, the thumb like he's playing through it 
uh, like tonight, I tweeted this after the game tonight. How tonight's game, they had a big opportunity to get out, get out to a big lead. The Sixers did not look like they looked bad in that first quarter, yep. and the Bulls looked just as bad. And like it was, when they were down one after that first quarter, and that is again just like their offense has just been getting off to such slow starts. Outside of like that, what that Celtics game where they hit the five threes early, like they've just been so struggling to get to get into rhythm to start games. So like Javante is what he is, and the problem is just like the team just don't give a crap about him. Defend like he's uh, Chris, you mentioned just like if, with Vooch playing bad as well, it's like almost being f- uh, three on five. It's just like Javante, just the teams don't guard him. He can't really do anything besides like do hustle plays. Like his three point shooting is like okay, but his volume is so low. It's just like. Like you said, J- J- DJJ is like not going to be that much better, but he, I think he definitely is a better player. So he might as well play the better player more. So like, Javante is almost like on a Bogan's plan right now, but like, you really just can't afford to do that. I feel like so like the starting lineup, that starting lineup together has been in the negative. I know, uh, just overall, it just hasn't been very good. And with the slow start things, I feel like you have to try something. Like I don't know if he'll do it on Monday, but. Uh, it's definitely something that they have to look at. And again, I don't, yeah, it's hard to hit on Javante Green. The guy plays his ass off every night. He just he isn't that, that good. He's just it's, not very good. So, like, bring that energy off the bench def- defensively, which is what Derek Jones Jr. is doing right now. I mean, DJJ, what he did, he started basically all year with Portland last year, right? I know they, that was, they were a disappointing team, but like, he's got the pedigree, as you said, Ricky. I feel like it's something that they're probably going to look at pretty soon here if these starts. Uh, keep being so slow because they well, just, they just can't afford to keep getting they, these holes like they, they can't afford to keep getting into 15 point holes every night you just can't win games like that all the time even if they've come they've uh, been close in some of these comebacks well the bulls are three and oh when javante green scores six points or more I just <laughs> no. the game log. so the keith bogan's <laughs> comparison is rock solid oh, right now man uh, it, that's funny it's you, you you really can't blame javante it's like blaming arch for being out there, it's like if Arch is playing 18 right. minutes a game, it's not Arch's fault. It's the team's right. got a problem. Yeah, right. It's <laughs> it's it's not what we should, we should expect. And I think I, I almost wonder. There's two things that come to mind. Number one is Turbound Junior, who has always shot over 40 percent from the corners his whole career from three. I don't think he played poorly. Like I think he played fairly well. And and I I'm wondering if if we see more of him or if, if there's something else going on there because I, I think he. He can provide anything that you know that those Io and Javante Green are providing, and I think he's a little bit better of an offensive player, and and I think he's a, a, a great shooter. I mean, Io had a tough night tonight, but he's he's been pretty good otherwise. Um, Kobe coming back you know, will will help that a little bit. But do you guys see? I don't know about you guys, but I feel like this roster is not complete. Like I, I feel like with that trade exception, that traded player exception looming, and Matt Thomas, who I really don't think is like a 15th player even on on a playoff roster i feel like something's coming but do you guys think that this roster is unfinished and do you think that they need to go out and get someone else uh, at some point during the season to, to help their rotation sure i said it on our podcast before the season started that my bold prediction was the bulls were going to swing a big trade in season obviously karnashov is dead at last year he was so he aggressive more. in reshaping this roster so why wouldn't he? He's got the extra first round pick. We still don't know what's happening with the tampering investigation. Unbelievable. First of all, it's like, what is yeah. going on with that? It's been three, what, three, four <laughs> months now? Like, what in the world is going on with this tampering investigation? So I say they've got to trade that Portland pick before the league takes it away from right. them. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's what yeah. I'm thinking. At this point, I'm like, man, <laughs> you guys better do something. Well, I was thinking about Brandon. I tweeted out today, I think it was Brandon Clark. about Brandon Clark in, in Memphis, who is a 6'8 forward. He's you know, very athletic. Uh, he's not stretching the floor better. for you either, but yeah, but he could still use another just far. big, bigger guy. And I guess yeah. the size wasn't the problem tonight, and was not the problem the other night. And they they won the rebounding battle. I think the last two games, surprisingly. I mean, oh. it, Ricky, you brought up Malik Beasley uh, on our one pod. They need more shooting. Right. He can. I don't know how he's doing for the Timberwolves so far. Uh, mm. They could they could use more. Sh- they could use more shooting for sure. Uh, they, I mean, they still could probably use another bigger player uh, just to have some more size or it's a bigger wing. I know somebody in the comments and something we've talked about, I think it was like, do they sign like J- a James Ennis type mm. uh, three and D ish wing? I know he's not a great shooter, but like 35, 36%. He's a bigger wing just to take kind of Pat's place and have a little bigger body than 
Javante at 6'4", or whatever he is, and DJJ is 6'5", but I know he plays a little bigger than that. Uh, I guess just the, ultimately to answer the question is, yes, they do feel incomplete. Uh, part of it's Kobe and then the pad injury. I feel like they definitely could use a little more help somewhere, <laughs> whether it's a trade, whether they sign somebody. Uh, they could definitely use a little more help. I, I was just thinking – um, the commenter said, uh, Scotty P will be go, will go crazy because I was just thinking, I was like, <laughs> if, if if Beasley comes Beasley, here, it'll be, right. it'll be nostalgic for Larza, you know what I mean? Like, it'll be oh, like, man. I used to be here, you know. <laughs> but no, I think, I, I think Beasley's dope, though. I, I think that'd be a dope uh option. So um, he averaged, I just pulled up his stats, he averaged 19 points a game last year. This year, he's down to 10, but he's still taking eight threes a game, knocking him down at, you know, near 40% clip. So that was a name I threw out there before Pat even got hurt. Yeah. I was thinking mm-hmm. that they might need another shooter. Mm-hmm. My, my concern is, sorry to cut you off. My, my concern is guarding big forwards and wings. Like Lonzo has been doing that yeah. so far. Yeah. And I, but I don't think he or Derek Jones are really in a position to be doing that. I mean, can you see them guarding LeBron for long stretches? I just yeah, okay. maybe I mean the Lakers are a whole. And they did, they did like right a now, decent but... job on Tatum the other night. I know Tatum yeah, has but... been kind of going through some stuff right now. Uh, but even with Pat healthy, we're yeah. like, well, they kind of need someone extra. They like, sort of need, need a, a big one who can shoot, ideally. That's all, like, I, like, Damn, James Dennis isn't great, but like <laughs> girl on three <laughs> out, maybe I don't know. Yeah, hey. tough. It's Harrison Barnes. That's okay, see, we, have, we have talked that's about the guy. Yeah, that's the guy that I think would really help us a lot. Uh, but I don't think Sacramento Sacramento never thinks that they're tanking until like March every right. year. <laughs> Even though everyone else knows in November. Harrison Barnes. Harrison Barnes would be dope. I what is he making? He's gonna be making like 20 million. Yeah. So I guess you'd have to tr- trade what? Like Pat. I don't even Derek know what else. Jones. 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 Yeah, so I, guess, I guess would get you pretty close. That yeah, you'd have to, I think you'd have to trade like Troy Brown and Derek Jones to get there. Um, sure, why not? <laughs> you could bring in Brandon Clark with just the trader player exception. He only makes two point seven million, and you got five million in trade player exception. The only problem is, what do the Grizzlies want? They probably want, you know, at least a second and probably something else back. I didn't realize that the Bulls have like no seconds until like twenty twenty. <laughs> well, they have one. They have like some one from like the Nuggets, I think, and then like no, none of their own until like twenty twenty six. So they're obviously just out. Their their draft stash right now is. Very low. Obviously, we know we've give, they've given up a lot to put this roster together, which is fine. We've said that's all right. But to make another move, like they just don't have too much at their disposal. I'm and, one of their be- and one of their best trade chips is uh, now out for the season, which is not great. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. Clark I'm would be interesting. Though. Clark, what, what is the deal with Clark? I know he's what out of – I've seen a lot of like draft Twitter people like love the roster the Grizzlies have put together, mm-hmm. a bunch of draft Twitter guys. Uh, and Clark was pretty. Is it, this is his third year? Second yeah. year? Yeah, he had third. a really strong start. Like, yeah, what's going on with him? Looked great. Yeah, last year he kind of fell out of the rotation, and this year he's been relegated to garbage time mostly. I think so. Uh, if they're giving up on him, that would be someone I think would be a really good candidate to take a flyer on. Absolutely. Uh, but again, not really sure. I I do think that Karnashovs is going to try to make a move though, given. Yeah. Yeah how aggressive he's been to this oh, no. point. And I think that, uh, yeah, what the hell is Thad Young up to right now? That's what I'm saying. Thad Young is like the heart-shaped, like the Thad-shaped young hole in our roster is missing Thad Young. Yeah, That's really it. <laughs> but you know what I'm going to say here, and feel free to tell me I'm wrong, but I felt like him and Vooch weren't a natural pairing together. Yeah. Because, like, Honestly, you could have Thad in the Vooch role. I'd rather have Thad maybe like just like as your starting center. I know they're already undersized as it is. But, you know, looking at last year's team, certainly you wouldn't say Thad was the problem. Like, Thad was awesome. He Thad was, was their second, best, second player best player on the team. Yeah. But then when you Levine's got Levine's best ever teammate until this year. But I feel like Thad <laughs> was playing a lot of center, right, yeah. last year. So then when you got Vooch, it's like, okay, now Thad needs to be more of a floor spacer. Well, that's actually the weakest part of his game. Where Thad was really good at was in the middle of the floor, facilitating the offense, doing the little, uh, you know. Yeah, the little flip floaters. Flip floaters. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing I brought up on (laughs) on the last episode of Cash Considerations. Not to totally overreact and totally sound like a Vooch hater, because I do think Vooch has done a lot of good things. It's some fire. That was one thing I brought up. He's like, you know, if you had Thad in that role, 
you know, how different would the team look? So yeah, I don't know. Like Fed would be great, but I do think that not a natural fit is your closing four. With that being said, maybe you just try to make it work because you're already shooting so few three pointers <laughs> and Thad would just be a massive talent upgrade over what they've had already. So uh, I didn't think he was a supernatural fit, but also his performance last year was just heroic. It's a crime <laughs> that he's not in the Spurs rotation this year, really. Yeah. So it, it would be incredible to have, to have Thad right. So now. It's just, okay. it's just like hard to make that to actually like actually do it because they can't trade for him. They if the Spurs could buy him out, but I'm pretty sure the Bulls can't sign him. He'd have to get traded somewhere else and then get bought out, and then they could sign him. So I think it's just like not really that feasible unless then unless that happens. I mean, maybe so. But I feel like I feel like the Spurs will want to. I think get something for him. Like Thad's still a good player, and I I think whoever trades for him isn't gonna like trade for Thad Young to waive him. So I feel like it's just like not realistic, sadly. No, he's he's gonna go somewhere else. But I I, I can't remember. I think Stefano told us they basically can't reacquire him this entire year unless like yeah, while he has to go somewhere. Yeah, he has to, to go somewhere else and then like get traded again, or he has and to then go, cut and then, and then pick cut, him off waiver. Yeah. Some some weird right, nonsense. Yeah, right. Well, that's that was like okay. Well, what about Wendell? Can I get Wendell back at least? <laughs> like bring him back. But but I, Ricky brings up a good point, which is Thad's effectiveness in the in the rotation last year really did really was diminished by the arrival of Vucevic. Yeah. And I, I do think with, De, especially with DeMar manning a lot of those second man units or Zach, one of those two, I do think his effectiveness would be a lot less, but I, I still think we do need a, someone who can guard big forwards on this team and make an open shot. And so far we don't have one of those. And, and the one we did have, um, you know, took a hard fall, when Mitch Robinson clotheslined him and is out for the season, unfortunately. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure he, you know, obviously he didn't mean to do that, but it's just, Lara just looks so sad again. When you, <laughs> you know, that's Lara's guy. Yeah. Man. I know. Uh, I you know, there was a play, play today man. where MB wrapped up, I think. Caruso, yeah. Caruso. Yeah. Where Caruso had a wide open shot to the basket, could have dunked it. And he wrapped up on the ground. And Benetti got really mad. He's like, oh, it's a hard foul. We love Benetti. <laughs> it was a hard foul by MB. Yeah. But, like, honestly, no, do that, dude. Because, yes. Wrap him up. <laughs> you know, you're not going to get – there's not going to be an injury if you're wrapping him up on the yeah. ground. When you're challenging Pat on the air at a chance – at a shot you had no chance to block. You were just trying to hit him and foul him yes. to prevent the easy dunk. It's like yeah, bro, that's one thing that was going through my head watching bro, this day. Bro, you're out of position. Down. You're out of position. Just chuck it up and be like, you know what? I gotta be in position <laughs> next time. Like, what are you doing? Like, I, I just I watched the replay and I literally <laughs> wanted to take a flight up to New York and like, you know, just, just pay a visit. <laughs> just want to me. talk. I just, just want to talk. talk to you, Mitch. I just want to know right. what were you I'm thinking. killing the vibes right now. Like, I'm sorry, I should not have brought that up. I'm killing the vibes. <laughs> but I, I do I do want to I do want to ask uh, Laro to to defend Vooch for a second. Because uh, some, of the, some of the comments here are talking about Vooch kind of being a liability on, def- on the defensive end. But I think that Vooch, other than the shooting, has actually been really good. Like, he's been a really good passer. He's played really well defensively within the system. Like, I think, I think Vooch, honestly, like, I, I know our friend Kevin Farragut was like, maybe Vooch is just washed. Like, ah, <laughs> no, no, no. Sl- like, I, no, no. And, I, and even I know he's nine games. slowing his role on that, on that take, obviously. But... He, I think he's been really effective otherwise. Do you guys agree with me that he's well, he's been pretty good other than the shooting? So he hasn't been turning the ball over either. He's been passing yeah. well, doesn't turn the ball over, but he doesn't get to the foul line, which hurts. And, I mean, at the end of the day, I, I feel like their defense is holding up really well right now, but also, like, what's going to happen when they go through this gauntlet over the next five games? Like, your backline rotations have to be really crisp when you're not playing with a natural rim protector at center, the Bulls have been able to do it through the early part of the schedule, which has been pretty soft. Uh, You're putting a lot of stress on sort of your role players to play a pivotal role because the scheme you're playing sort of fits Vooch's strengths, right? So I do think Vooch has been really good defensively. His hands have been active. He's playing the role they're asking him to play really well. But I do think that that scheme is going to get tested a little more as the competition improves. And offensively, it's like he's taking so many shots and he can't make anything. So I don't know. I might be a little more negative than most people on Vooch right now, but I have a friend. I don't think you are. I think a lot of people hate Vooch right now. I have a friend who really was hating on Boozer back in the day. And I think with the benefit of hindsight, 
Boozer, like I kind of love Boozer. Like he's just a lovable guy. <laughs> yeah. He really endeared himself to me as a human being. Booze news. But at the beginning oh my gosh, of the booze Boozer's news. tenure, he was pretty frustrating to watch Boozer. It's like, wasn't this guy supposed to be awesome? Now, like, you know, ne- couldn't even close games. Taj was great, but uh, give me that. <laughs> and my friends call him Vucevic Boozer. I love it. Oh no. <laughs> Boozer. And every every time he misses, I just think Boozer. Oh no. I, oh, no. I, I, then, I've been, been thinking above? the same thing. I was gonna tweet that that like Vucevic is like on the verge of becoming the next boozer. Just because I feel I mean it's don't just don't based, put that energy out there, Jason. I mean, just based <laughs> on like what uh just like my mentions, like and obviously just like just watching him struggle. It's like it's been tough. And obviously, like I think defensively, I think he's been for like what he is and his limitations, I think he's been battling hard. He's been trying. Sometimes it obviously just like looks so bad because he's so slow. So like sometimes when he gets beat, it looks just so so awful. And like, but there's been other times, I mean he battled against Embiid in the first game tonight. Embiid obviously just roasted. I mean, he was hitting it. Except Embiid was hitting just jumpers. He had a ton of jumpers tonight. And like when Embiid is knocking down all those shots from outside the paint, like tip that's a tip your cap type mm-hmm. deal to him when he's hitting four threes and when he's just I know he's a great mid range shooter last year, but like when he's hitting those like fadeaway shots, like one like, what are you gonna do about that? He's seven two, Good he's three hundred pounds. Like if Embiid is hitting those shots on you, he's an MVP candidate, and that's not all on him. Like obviously Vooch does have his flaws and some when he's playing pick and roll defense sometimes he's just just not not very mobile. I mean, but I think he's at least tried on that end. Like I don't know if maybe if they're asking him to do like to if like what he's asked to do defensively is hurting him on offense. I have no idea. But uh obviously he's been very frustrating with the obvious I mean so many good looks tonight that he just missed. And I tweeted uh, the the open three that he missed when the Bulls had taken the lead and they had a chance to go up yeah. go up four and he misses that and then Embiid Hits the three on the other end after Seth Curry flop. Like Vooch runs over Seth Curry, who flops, and Vooch just stops. Like, what playing. is Vooch supposed to do with? Like, right. is he going to step yeah. on Seth? I mean, yeah. like, what is the right? Exactly. That's and a just really like great bogus. That, that swing was just like and that. Just like yeah. deflated. Like I feel like the team. I think I know they tied the game up again after that, but it just like that took the air out of the crowd when Vooch missed that and and beat hit the three on that bogus. Yeah. Flop um, the other end. It was and it was just brutal. Like, and, and he's just missing all those kind of. Like, I mean, wasn't it the first? First possession of the game or second possession of the game, Booch gets like a wide open, like seven foot shot in the paint off pick and roll, and he bricks it. It's like not even close, and like he's like not even close on these misses. Like Zach, Zach has had all these in and out three pointers, and just feels like he's like just off. Who knows what's going on with that thumb? Booch, I feel like he's just like not even close on a lot of these shots. And you mentioned how like he's under fifty percent at the rim. Like how are you that bad on these shots at the rim, man? Like yeah, all these just close, good looks shots. Like it's just like it's unbelievable. And you have to think he's gonna turn around at some point. It's like you don't want to bail on the guy. Like I don't think he's washed. I mean he's 30, 31. Like he was good for the Bulls offensively last year. I don't think all of a sudden like, like he's now just like terrible. It just it has just been very brutal to watch him miss all these great looks. Uh, Lara, what do you think about the scheme defensively with Vooch in the middle? Like, because I know you've been sort of pumping him up, what he's doing well, and he is doing a lot well, no doubt. So, just curious what you see from him uh, defensively and, you know, from how the Bulls are running their defense right now. So, defensively, like, I, I just think they're just really relying um, on that backside rotation, like you've mentioned before. Um, and before tonight, like, I really thought the point of attack defense has been like really damn good. But I felt like Maxi was really like able to get downhill and attack Vooch, yeah. and and we know that Vooch, his feet, you know, uh, they ain't they ain't that fast. So if Maxi's gonna be attacking you full speed, that's not gonna be a good look. But I think the the the, the scheme that they want to run in order for it to be like really damn good, like the point of attack has to be has to be better. You know, guys can't really it puts a lot of pressure on the on Io and Caruso and TBJ when he's in there, Zach when he's in point of attack. It puts a lot of pressure on those guys to not get hit and stay in front. So it allows Vooch to be in the right position to defend the basket and use his hands and deflect passes. Um but I, I thought I thought he's been I, I think he's been good. I, I think um for what Vooch is you know he's not, he's not Rudy. Rudy Gobert, yeah. You know he's not Bam. Not he's not. Embiid. He's not right. He's not Embiid. I mean, uh, so it's like, uh, it is what it. Like you guys said, like coming into the season, you kind of knew like what could be the limitations of the offense and what could be the. I mean, for Lonzo, um, it's kind of the same thing for for Vooch on the defensive end. Like you, you knew what the limitations were, but how are you going to mitigate some of those those limitations, right? So. 
Um, they did a really they, like some games. They have him at the level of the screen. Uh, some games is an aggressive drop where they he show, he, he's there at the level and then he drops back immediately. Um, and I thought I, I think he's been doing really well. You know, having guys like Javante on the back end and, and DJJ, I think I think because I, I started thinking about this when you said like the rim protection um, has been a problem um, and going forward, it could be a problem. And I think uh, and no doubt Javante, I think, has really good instincts. Um, I feel like sometimes he steals the like he's right where the pass is going to be before it even gets there. Sometimes when he steals the ball, but um, I would really like to see DJJ more in these games upcoming because I I think the dude just really is ex like super explosive with with that seven foot wingspan, and I I, I want to see what that looks like um, against some of these teams on the backside because I think I think he could be how explosive he is and, and like like I said how long of arms he has. I think he can be a, 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 I don't want to say elite at all. I don't want to say that because we have, you know, but I think he can be very serviceable um, on the backside and, and really protecting the rim just because he could just jump so damn high as two by fours for the arms and he can really just go up and get it. Um, but as for Vooch, I, 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 I do think he's been playing well. Um, he does have times where uh, I, I believe, against the Celtics where it was like uh, Chicago action where it's a pin down into a dribble handoff. And uh, the, the guy that set the pin down, he rolls in like it, Vooch has a problem, like getting back uh, fast enough to really, uh, to, to, to get a hand up on the oop. And I think teams, if they really wanted to, they could probably do that uh, to him more. Uh, but I think the, the Caruso and Io um, and and uh, who am I? And Lonzo have Lonzo. been a really damn good job uh, opponent of attack. I thought tonight was probably the, if I had to pick, probably the worst they've done as a as a as a group. Yep, Maxi um, looked so fast. With yes, the today. Yes, he was, was cooking. Everyone. And they were a bit sloppy, just like guarding the three too at yes. at times. Oh uh, my gosh! Every time I left. Freaking Korkmaz, Korkmaz <laughs> yeah. open on bad rotation. Every time you like you, I, I'm I don't know about you guys, but I'm I'm actually I'm like he's gonna be open. Like, you guys are too slow. Don't don't double and beat for no. Like, oh. You brought that up, right? I, see, here's the thing. Like, if I was coaching that game, like I probably would have did the same thing as Billy. But the thing is, Zach, like Zach, should probably be thanking Vooch right now because if Vooch wasn't playing as bad as he's been playing on offense, like people would be roasting Zach defensively. Like I think Zach has not been, uh, he's not good at all. Like in terms of as an overall defender, like, but I thought he, he played really well off ball and, all, and as a point of attack defender uh, um, last season. And then this season, I kind of feel like he's tailing off a bit. Like there was a, um, uh, Chris, well. yeah, yeah, Chris, um, no, he definitely did start well. Um, Chris tweeted it today. Uh, uh, they doubled Embiid. Lonzo rotates out to, uh, I think it was Seth, I think, at the top of the key. And then Zach was the next rotation to Furcon. And it, it, it was, that was the last three here, right? Yeah, yes. He was, he was slow. He was definitely, you saw it in real time. He was slow getting out there. What, what like, if as soon as you see Lonzo go, like, Zach, what are you doing? Like, yeah. you know, Furcon is the point time. of the game. At the point of the game, you need to be. That was yep. crunch time. You need to be quick on those rotations. You, you can't just like be loafing out there. It's frustrating. And then there was a play in the – was it the first half? Well, he, he was going – he was driving off the wing, and he dribbles into two guys. And we got – I think it was Lonzo was wide open at the three line. I'm like, what a, Zach, what are we doing? <laughs> and he's complaining about a foul. And I'm like, maybe it was a foul. But, like, bro, like, we got Lonzo at the three-point line ready to, to, to pull that thing, hopefully. Um, and it's just like – you know, Zach has these. I don't know. Maybe he's getting comfortable because he has two 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 offensive players with him now. They, I don't know. May I'm just guessing, but like I feel like yeah. maybe he's getting a little comfortable where he's at, and he. I don't know, but I would. I I don't know, man. And, and I don't it's know. Like I mentioned before, like Zach's putting up good numbers. Like his three point shooting is way down. He's putting up good numbers. It just it does not feel like he's playing well or like even close to as well he as he can be for sure. The decision making has been has not been there. I think yeah. he's been forcing and pressing stuff at times, yeah. like just playing a little too panicky at times. And like he, he he's so talented. Where sometimes he just he can be so aggressive and he makes shots, but other times where he'll just chuck something up. And I mean the last last game, uh, two nights against the Sixers. I mean he was so bad in that fourth quarter. Like the decision making was like it was like a 
the last couple years, Zach, where he thinks he has to do everything and he's like forcing stuff. Like, dude, you mm-hmm. chill out. You don't have to do that. So, like, I, just, I don't want to hate on, on him too much because he is playing hurt. He is still putting up decent numbers, but yeah, he definitely is not helping the team as much as we, he as he definitely can. He he hasn't been as good as uh, he hasn't taken. He hasn't gotten better. I mean, he's something we talk about. He's gotten better every year in Chicago. He has definitely. Yes. Not been he's not been better than he was last year. That's for sure. I, I, know, I think one of the things too, like I, I first thing I wanted to point out was, uh, I, was it last game? I think it was last game when DDR had it going in the fourth quarter. Like he was just going crazy, and Zach subs in and he yep. takes the first shot. Yes. And I'm like, yes, yes, yes. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Zach, what what are we doing? You know, yep. but I I have to pull myself back sometimes because I feel like. It's so easy to like criticize these guys because you know yeah. they're professionals and and they play this game for a living and everything. And but I, I feel like this is a learning experience for Zach and Vooch. Like DDR is basically doing what he does. You know, like he's getting he's getting probably the worst perimeter defender because most of the time they're gonna have the best defender on on Zach, so he can go to work. You need him to play on ball. He can do that. He did that in San Antonio. So he's like he's used to this. He's used to um, doing what he's being asked of right now. But I think for Vooch and Zach, it's a, it's an adjustment, you know, because Zach is so used to being the guy, you know, OK, fourth quarter time is my time, you know. But I think now it's like Zach is still learning now. Like it's going to take some time. I would yeah. I, me personally, I would say close to all star break, maybe somewhere around there, hopefully sooner. But um, these guys are like Zach's got to know. OK, all right. OK, let me go off ball. DDR has got it. If he passes it to me, I'll be ready to go. But like. And Vooch. Vooch is actually, as much as I support Vooch, and I'm still going to support Vooch, like he probably has the easiest job uh, in terms of, uh, he gets the easiest shots, I'll say that. Oh, but he's had some wide open looks, and I'm just used to Vooch knocking those down. I right. really am. Um, but like, I, I went back and watched some magic film, and and dude was on the block a lot. He like, yeah, he shot some threes, but he was definitely on the block a lot, and and you know, getting those touches as well. And I think that's a little, I think that's a missing a little bit. Um, I, I would like to see him on the block a little bit more, but again, like if you're gonna be with DDR, like DDR likes to get to the paint and shoot his, you know, mid-ranger. So I I don't know, man. Like it, I want to see this group get better. Um, and I but I just think it'll take a little bit more time. Like it's great that we're six and three while while they're still figuring things out offensively. Um, but I, I would love to see them figure some things out uh sooner rather than later. Um Schedule is just so dang brutal. Yes, <laughs> it's awful. Like, yes, uh, I know. I know. Like Brooklyn is not like they're beatable. They they haven't looked great. L. A. We'll see if LeBron is playing in that game. But that, they play Clippers, Lakers back to back in L. A. Like, it's. I mean, maybe that's for the better, so they don't have the the L. A. Night out. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> uh, and then I, I mean, Golden State has best defense in the league right now. They, they their road trip starts in Golden State next Friday national tv game like i mean it just in dallas on wednesday it just it never ends just this entire this, this stretch is just insane like and it's like it, as fun as it is to watch like these high profile matchups and like have them like really just throw feet to the fire thrown into the fire like this like it is not exactly ideal when you're trying to work in these new guys and you have some of these injuries so it's like yeah, I, mean, I was the late. I mean, the Lakers have not been good. They got smoked tonight too without yeah. LeBron by the Blazers. But like their schedule has been like they played the Thunder twice and like the Rockets twice. Like why can't we get that? Like give us a few <laughs> more. I know we played the Pistons twice already, but like give us a few more cupcakes here, I, I, <laughs> and not just I'm, like all these elite teams. I'm glad you brought up the the Warriors because I I want <laughs> Billy to while he's coaching the game. Have the assistant coaches watch. Just just watch what they again. He's not Zach. Is not Steph Curry. Not saying that, but just watch how they use Steph Curry off ball. Like, look at some of the things they do with him. You know, what are they doing off ball with Jordan Poole? What are they doing with Damian Lee? Like, what, these guys are moving around there. It's it's a lot more like he wants to play ball, uh, uh, player movement, ball movement, but it's dribble handoff, empty side pick and roll, dribble handoff, dribble handoff, dribble. Hand, and it's like, let's do some different things. So, I, I just hope that this grow it grows more. Like, Steph pointed out before the season the Hawk series, right? And the the Bulls have been doing the Hawk cut, but it hasn't really, you know, they haven't finished out the series. They haven't, they haven't done anything differently. And I, I don't know if that's just because they've been focusing so much on defense and training camp and practices that they just haven't got to the offensive side yet. But I, I, they got to do more. 
they just have to use Zach more off ball. Like they had a, a play today at Horns. They had Zach in the top as a screener. He sets a screen. He pops. There was a perfect opportunity for a split screen action. They didn't even look that way. Ended up turning into a, a, a Alonzo floater. And it's like, I just wish there was more. All right, Ricky. I know. I know you've been waiting. When waiting a few minutes here, you're like, I know I can see you're like ready to. No, no, I don't even have anything now. There were a few things I wanted to say uh, throughout that, but yeah. Well, one thing I'll say is that like Levine's defense has always been spotlighted as his biggest shortcoming, but in reality, it's probably like his processing. Like mm-hmm. if he could really process the game at a super high level, then he would probably be that like heliocentric star because he is just so talented. Uh, in terms of shot making and like how effortlessly he can get to the basket at his best. But yeah, it's always been an issue with him. Right. And that's why the people who thought bringing in another ball dominant star to play next to him and DeMar DeRozan, that's sort of what they were discounting. I think like Zach needed someone like DeMar, I think making the best version of himself, but the offense has been a little bland to this point. And uh, there's just better ways to unlock Zach. Now he is playing hurt. Yeah. I think that he's a better shooter than a 34% shooter. He's just going to regress to the mean positively. Uh, in and out have been killing me. I mean, he had two more tonight with three right. pointers that just halfway down and out. It's like he makes a few of those and that percentage looks much better. It's been <laughs> driving me nuts. <laughs> but yeah, I, I totally agree with the idea of redistributing more mm-hmm. offensive initiation to DeRozan letting Levine cook a little bit more off ball. It's not something he's used to. Now that might be an area where the cohesion comes into play. Like Zach sort of figuring out his tricks of how to play off ball, Billy figuring out how to coach it. I'm thinking back to Billy coached Paul George during Paul George's, I think he came in third in MVP that season. Like he was playing a lot of on ball there, but like it was still Westbrook. Right. That was a Westbrook. <laughs> yeah. Go back to some of that stuff that you were using with Paul George playing off Westbrook. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember how healthy Westbrook was that whole year. Lero talks to me about this almost every day about <laughs> that specific thing. <laughs> That's why he's shaking his head right now. He's like, <laughs> go ahead, Larry. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. I've been it. saying that for months. <laughs> Dude, I just like you guys have been saying it all night. And and Chris said it as well. Like he said the the offense is being made harder than it needs to be made and i if you want some of the shots to the shots that vooch has taken you kind of want them to dwindle a little bit and until he gets going i i can understand it but what are you going to do differently right if you don't if, if you want vooch to not be the guy the play finisher uh what are you going to do differently right because you've just been doing dribble handoffs and empty, empty side pick and rolls uh, you're not really doing anything else differently other than that. You know, you do a little bit of split act, uh, split, uh, split action, I'm sorry, here and there, but it's not like anything different that the defense has to worry about. And so like, if you don't want Vuce to shoot the, shoot, shoot the shots, then what are you going to be doing? You know, if you, what are you going to do? You're going to run some inverted pick and roll. What are you going to do? Like if Zach is not being used to the, the best of the ability uh, that, that he has, like he can stress, the, he can stress the floor vertically as well. I think we have one, one one play out of a timeout where you cut back door and, and oop, but like he can do those things more often. You can set some things up for for him to catch some oops. You can run him off different screens, staggers, different. They're not doing enough with Zach, and and they need to use that. Even if he's not making a shot, he's always going to get that attention, and that gives you more space and more opportunity for other players to get open looks. And and I just feel like they're not doing that enough. And you brought up the Paul George in, in Oklahoma City, like Hawk series. Just just go back and watch how Billy used PG in the Hawk series. There were so many different options out of it. Like it's not just you one play and it's a three. Like, no, like there was different things you could do out of the, the play, depending on what the defense offered to you or showed you. And I feel like they're just not doing enough. They're not doing enough. And um, again, maybe that's just because they focus on defense. I don't know. But I, I want to see more, man. I, just use Zach. If he's not going to be on the ball, like move him around. Make the defense have to worry about where's Zach. You know, like that's one of the things you're when you're playing basketball. Where are the shooters? Where find the shooter? Like where is that? If you're just going to keep him in the corner, well, well, Zach's still there. All right, well, all right, well, I'm just chilling. Yeah. 
Well, for sure. I think that one of the optimistic things I can take from this is in years past, we haven't had the talent. It wasn't about optimizing talent. It was like, we don't have enough talent. So like everybody's stretching in their role, right? Like you got Kobe being the, the starting point guard and you got Wendell Carter being like his offensive hub and the, you know, like the, Lowry Markin is supposed to be the second best scorer on the team. Everyone was stretching their own. Archie Jackson was playing 15 minutes a game. Like there's everyone on the team. Like Thad, Thad Young has become Magic Johnson. Like <laughs> everyone on the team last year had to overachieve and be stretched further than they, than they were supposed to be. Now this year it's like we've got all the talent necessary to be a quality offensive team. And so it's, it's a, and we, and we knew that it was going to take time and we knew that this, the, the schedule was going to be tough. So I still think about this, like if we're at 500 or better at the end of this November stretch, I still think we're in a good spot because yeah. this is a really tough stretch. Um, but the individual losses still hurt. Cause like you always think, Hey, in that tough stretch, there's always going to be a game or two where you can take advantage of someone being out or someone being, you really having, wanted you know, to Miami nightlife games. This, this yeah. was the opportunity yeah. to take. Yeah. And they they missed it both times. I thought, especially with Matisse out. Like, come on, <laughs> like, right, like yeah. Matisse Tybel is like Zach Levine's kryptonite <laughs> dribbling. Like, he's I've never seen anyone stop Zach like 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 Thibel does. But I do want to, you know, kind of end on a positive note in the sense that it is a tough schedule. But we are six and three. We're th- I think we're third in the East right now. We've got a tough schedule, but the schedule gets significantly easier as the the year goes on and so i think they can use this time that's it's going to magnify the weaknesses but they can now hey let's focus let's 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 clean up these things now with this tough schedule and then hit a stride maybe like the hawks did last year and, and kind of keep going um you did mention one thing laro about vooch on the block i wonder if what uh, my my initial thought was to take vooch out early and have him cook with like have him do that on the bench but they don't have a bunch of shooters on the bench. So I w- almost want to do the opposite, which is take DeMar out early and have Vooch be like a do creation from the block and spray out the shooters. Do you, do you think that's something that could be effective getting him going early? I mean, because DeMar has been DeMar. But yeah. w- when DeMar's on the floor, we want the ball in DeMar's hands. And even though Vooch has kind of been like the cog in the middle, making it all happen, yeah, I almost want to see him, you know, if you anytime you guys play pickup basketball and you're in a slump, I don't know about you guys because I, I like to shoot threes or like drive to the basket. <laughs> and if if I'm not hitting, I, shoot threes. I I try and I just I hang around the basket. I'm trying to get layups. I'm trying to get free throws. Like anything that's easy to get me going. And if Vooch, you know, Vooch on either side of that block is a phenomenal player, <laughs> like one of the best in the NBA. You got to get him those easy shots. But do you guys think that could be an effective? way to kind of get him going early is is to try and run some stuff through him on the block absolutely that was one thing i was thinking is like vooch basically made a big leap as a shooter last year mm-hmm. the bulls need the version of vooch where he's a big time shooter to sort of offset demar like when demar's on the floor you need vooch to be a spacing center but vooch has really only had one super good three-point shooting season so yeah, I think that, you know, he's more comfortable more comfortable throughout his entire career. He doesn't have a dunk yet this year. Like, before he used to be a guy who could finish. Did he have one tonight? Did he have one tonight? I think he had a, I think he had a running tonight. I think early on. Tonight. He might yeah. Have one, yeah. So then that's yeah. his first, because he didn't have one coming into this game. Uh, but, yeah, like, for DeRozan to be his best, they need Vooch to be a spacer. I still think Vooch is commanding respect from opposing defenses when he does stretch out to three. Yeah. Uh, which benefits the offense just yeah. just with that instead of having a total non-threat out there. Um, but for him to get going, yeah, I love the idea of him working more inside on the second unit, getting back to what has been the bread and butter throughout his career. Right now it really feels like he's trying to remake his game, almost similar to Thad under Boylan, right, when they needed Thad to <laughs> oh, space. Gosh. <laughs> Boylan and Boylan was basically just putting Thad in the corner, and Thad didn't look that good his first year on the bowl. He hated it, but it was he almost retired. He <laughs> yeah. has to be a floor space. And then the next year, he has a bunch of success because he's the guy making everything happen in the middle of the floor. So, yeah, interesting. All right, I I have before I let you guys go. I have I have one question for each of you that I want each of you to answer, which is if John Paxson did not fire himself last season 
who would be on the roster today and what would the Bulls record be? So you can you can get creative with this if you want. Oh gosh. <laughs> what does the Bulls roster look like today if John Paxson doesn't fire himself? And who's the coach? Yeah, great questions all around. <laughs> I'm going to say, <laughs> I don't know, I'm saying he's going back to the Skiles well. So Scott Skiles, head coach. What's... Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, Markkinen, you know, Markkinen potential still on the team. There's no way Paxson would have been smart enough to pull off all these sign and trades or connected enough, right? Like, yeah, Bulls never did that. So, yeah, I mean, would he have made the Vooch trade? Probably no not. chance, no, no chance, chance. Right? no chance he makes the Vooch he, trade. he, he probably would have traded or like waived those players to open up cap space to extend right. Levine. Because he was, he knew he was going to leave in the offseason, or he would have just traded Zach at the beginning. He would have traded season. Levine. He would have traded Levine <laughs> because he had never impacted record. winning. He wasn't good enough to be the best player on a championship team. <laughs> Actually, you know, it wouldn't surprise me. Like, yeah, They're, that's probably what it is. They uh, they probably would try to if he didn't fire himself. They probably rebuild again. They try to like buy time with another rebuild, and they just trade Zach. That it's probably like my best guess. And so, who knows who the heck would be on the team cool. now? And you'd have some. Maybe they would, and they would. Maybe Boylan would still be the coach, which just to try to coach through a rebuild, which would be absurd. Uh, Felicio Valentine. <laughs> Is it Valentine? Denzel now. Valentine. Yeah, you have Denzel Is Valentine, Valentine back point guard, Lowry at the four. <laughs> I would have... say, though, like uh, just them trying, even if like part of like there's gonna be frustrating aspects of the team. It's not expected to be a championship level team. But to just like I we're just, going from the crap to championship level in one season. I'm just so willing to give them the benefit of the doubt on this because I'm so happy. This is what I always want, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the previous rebuild was absolutely going nowhere. They had to make a significant change. So I kind of feel like this year is just like found money. Like the Bulls are gonna be fun. Yeah, they're gonna be in a really tough stretch right now. Yes, they lost two winnable games. Absolutely right here. And really, they should have lost to the Celtics. They were playing terrible throughout that game until the huge comeback. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I'm just so happy with the direction they went that I, th- I do feel like generally as a fan, I'm more willing to be forgiving for this current team just because of the way they went about building it. than uh, I was in the past, which really seemed like in, you know, an elevator nowhere, pretty much. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. I, I, I will say the, the one thing I'm sure of, if Paxson was still here, they would have maxed out their cash considerations this year in <laughs> right. trades. You know it. Absolutely. Especially if they were actually rebuilding. But the, Well, <laughs> when they did start the rebuild, that's when they traded Jordan Bell for cash considerations, and that's like how, how we started the our podcast. The anti-rebuild move. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> also, Trade draft picks for cash considerations when you're starting a rebuild. <laughs> I also wonder who like they would have drafted like Joshua Primo. Like, like, I don't know. Like, that would have been funny to see who they would have drafted as well. Maybe they would have like, taken Halliburton. I see. Yeah, Ooh, I mean, yeah Halliburton maybe. actually brought that was, or Obi yeah. or Denny. True. Oh, true. Yeah. Good. Halliburton true. is is Ames. Mocha, There's no right? way they take Pat. No way. They take yeah. Pat. Halliburton no. was Iowa State, right? Yeah. yeah. Ames Mafia. Yeah. yeah so that was. actually would have that and actually would have worked player. out all right. Was <laughs> that, that's that's the true. One, I'd always said the time is the, the one time that they probably should have taken an Iowa State player is the time that they didn't. But, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Obviously, just just jokes here because I love Pat, but uh, yeah, that was really hey, funny. Man. He's good. Halliburton's good. Halliburton is, is very good. Yeah, yes, he is. Ricky, and Ricky, you weren't you weren't sold on Halliburton, right? No, no, yeah. he's been awesome. Yeah, I think been... that uh, you know, like when I looked when I was evaluating him as a guard prospect, I saw a lot of the flaws you see in like Lonzo Ball. Yeah, where he, he, he didn't get to the rim. Really break yeah. down the opposing defense, yes. attack the rim, get to the foul line. But he found another guard who's a high level. Yeah, yes. And Darren Fox sort of allowed him to slot into his most comfortable possible role. But halliburton has been awesome. I mean, nothing but respect to him. Yeah, uh, for maximizing himself and really like, you know, there's like a certain community of basketball analysts that like I feel like they really don't like Demar Derozan. Yeah, <laughs> his style is an affront to how the game should be played i look at it like this guy's got significant flaws for the modern era but he's still pretty good still like, he's still still very good more. i feel the same way about lonzo in a sense too yep. like he's flawed inherently in a way that should really bring him down yeah but all those guys have like become pretty good players despite having significant flaws in their game so 
respect them more instead of hate. Them. Absolutely. Well, and, and as you mentioned, the fit is so important, right? If you're going to have Demar on your team, you need a guy like Zach. You need a guy like Vooch to help space the floor. You need, if you're going to have Lonzo, who's not going to get to the free throw line, who's not going to break down the defense, you got to have guys that can do that and and that can play off ball. And as you, met, you mentioned, Demar and Lonzo have have both overcome their kind of natural weaknesses for what they're required to do and have become really productive, good NBA players. And that that's what I wish we could tell the Lonzo stands. I'm a Lonzo stand. I like Lonzo. <laughs> I think he's a great player. I think he fits really well on the Bulls. And I think the, the Bulls are this island of misfit toys right now that all actually fit together really well offensively. I really do. I really think that they, they do. If There's they a could ton just a room, ton of room for improvement, yes, it'd be so much the, better. That's yeah. the thing is I, for the, and I mentioned that a little bit earlier is mentioning how everyone was overstretched last year. We have the talent. We have the talent. I think we've got a coach who is proven in all of his stops has proven to be good at uh, putting guys in positions to succeed within their roles, within their skill sets. I think they can do better. I think they can do more. And I think we'll see it. I think we'll see it over the next couple months. I think we'll see them um, optimize those things, you know, over time. But I agree. I, I, yeah. Much, but there are good times ahead. Like obviously tonight yeah. sucked. These last couple of have been brutal. The next couple of weeks could could be rough. Uh, don't want to get too down. As annoying as tonight's game was, and I know a lot of people are freaking out. And I, and I was, my tweet, some of my tweets are freaking out too. But like, <laughs> I think they'll be all right. They they have so much room for improvement. Uh, and I think they'll definitely be better. It's, it, we knew it was going to take some time. I feel like we, I mean, we warned about it that it was going to take some time. And doing it, doing this against the schedule is tough. Losing games like this is tough. They'll be all right, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of easily confident about that. Kind of excited to see how they, how these guys, either step up or 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 take a back seat to some of these uh, star matchups. You know, because you know when you like, for instance, like when Derek was here, like you knew when we if we were playing like a Russell Russell Westbrook or if we were playing like a Darren Williams. Chris Paul, you knew, yeah, you knew Derek was coming to play ball, and I, I want to see how that is with yeah. us, like this squad. I want to see if like we got Kevin Durant, James Harden. Like I want to see if these guys step up and like another test, man. Yeah, yeah, the Clippers, you, lose another these, test. you lose this game, you lose these two games, you lose this game tonight. Like Monday with the Nets coming in, like they 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 need to be the energy just needs to be there to start at least. Like, yeah, oh they, yeah, they, they came out so flat today. It was just so frustrating. I feel like yep. uh, that first quarter. At the end of the first just, quarter, I was like, this is going to be a bad game. It was game. a sleepy first <laughs> quarter. It was just like, whatever. It was just, <laughs> they could have come out and like beat their ass in this first quarter, and they did not. It would be nice yeah. to at least come out and play and just bring it. Even if the net, whatever. Obviously, some, if the Nets, if KD and Harden go off, it happens. But like, at least bring it and at least compete for the entire game from the start. We need to the see The Nets that. are in a back-to-back in Toronto. Sunday. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Great opportunity. Got the opportunity to yeah. try to gas them early in that yeah. game. Try to catch them off guard. Yeah. Like you don't want to let Kevin Durant get settled into the game, right? You need to come no. out strong <laughs> in that game. You cannot guard him. There's no, no guarding Kevin but, Durant. Uh, well, yeah, the Bulls have no one good to throw at him. Gosh, man, that's gonna be tough. That's gonna be tough. <laughs> Who's gonna guard him? Derek Jones. Yeah, he might. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. I mean, I guess. Mondo. If, <laughs> the answer is always Lonzo, right? Well, they know, a you know, dynamic big man. It's like Lonzo. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem, man. We can't have that going on anymore. But Tyler Cook, well, maybe bring him off the bench. <laughs> lots, lots, of exci- <laughs> lots of exciting times ahead. I, I, for the first time in a long time, I really care about the Bulls, and that's where the losses sting. Yeah, because you're like, like living and dying every, by them. Every yeah. game, every game, you're like, they could beat this team. Like that's how I go into this, these games. Like they can beat this team. They have enough talent. So, but I have to remember that a hey, if this team goes like fifty and thirty two, let's say that means they're going to lose thirty two games. Like I gotta, yeah. I gotta remind 51's myself. Fifty ones would be in, absolutely incredible. And, I mean, yeah, it'd be amazing. Yeah. Season, absolutely incredible, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, if they won fifty games, that's what you predicted. I know on your your podcast, Jason. You're like, wait a minute, and that pre- you Homer. I, I never really go back and like, that. It just yeah. kind of <laughs> came to that. <laughs> See, I'm just saying, you went through the schedule and you're like, oh, this is a win, this is a loss. You're like, oh man, I got fifty wins in here. <laughs> I, oh yeah, I remember I, that. I remember. I, I revised yeah. that down once uh i realized that's what happened but yeah but you know there's 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 good times and bad times ahead but if if they can be over 500 and be a playoff team i mean goals reached for the season and well it's just a fun season so yeah uh, 
before before I let you guys go, for, if for some reason you guys are living under a rock and you don't know what cash considerations is, or you don't know you don't follow Ricky and, and Jason, uh, do yourself a favor and do so. So I want to leave you guys uh, to to pimp your work for a second. So so Jason, we'll start with you. Tell people where they can find you and your work. Uh, let's see, Twitter at bulls underscore j, uh, bull stuff, SB Nation, bloggable, Forbes, cash considerations, Chicago's podcast. Shout out to Blue Wire Network. Uh, and then clutch points as well. Ricky, all you. Yeah, I'm at SP Nation. Listen to Jason and I talk about the Bulls, the cash considerations. So many good Bulls podcasts these days. You guys are killing our players. So uh, anyone who is listening to cash considerations, we appreciate it. Come check it out if you want to. And otherwise, all my work's at SP Nation. Doing a lot of editing these days, but I'm also just like writing random stories too. So uh, come check it out if you want to. I'm always interested in in Ricky's like insight on prospects, man. So I I I, I can't wait. I, are you going to be doing some for an upcoming draft or? Of course, yeah. I already I did. Wait, a, I did a preseason mock draft. So which is basically just a big board. You know, you yeah. title it mock. Yeah. Draft. That's what people <laughs> yeah. search for. But I didn't put any teams on there, so I did a preseason board. And I'm uh, gonna have to see where you got Jaden Ivy. Yeah, I think I had Ivy around 15. Okay. Maybe okay. I'd, have to, I'd have to check it again. It's been a while since I did it, but. Should be uh it's gonna be an interesting year for the draft too. So maybe yeah. well, might have two first round picks, might have zero first round picks. <laughs> we'll see. The Bulls <laughs> might get canceled as an organization. We'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, they get so they'll much go in the on. canceled culture casket with Aaron Rodgers. That's right. That, a new podcast. <laughs> yeah, cancel culture bulls. So we'll appreciate you guys coming on. It's it's been a long time coming. We uh, finally got you guys on, on a weekend if you're not busy and you yeah. know party animals and everything so got it's you so drinking beer at home here. instead for a few <laughs> hours and uh, so thank you guys so much yeah the bulls community is so amazing uh when, when we started our podcast last year it was nothing but but i don't know uh, people were just so collaborative and and welcoming so yeah. we're really appreciative of you guys and, and everyone else in, in bulls nation that's been uh really welcoming and Obviously, I've been around. We've been around for a long time, but I haven't had much of like an online presence before. So it's been really cool. So, uh, yeah, check out Cash Considerations. Follow uh, Ricky and Jason's work. And uh, thanks for listening to Bulls 101. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing to Barroom Network. Barroom Network, shout out to you guys for uh, hosting us. It's been really cool. Uh, Laro, any parting thoughts before we head out here? Any 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 optimism? I know, like you, you got to be my anchor here. <laughs> any optimism for this coming week? Um, I would just say a, a word uh, that I love to use when I'm 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 feeling a little down or or something's getting at me. Woo sa, you know, like you just you just gotta just gotta let it go. You know, write down notes. You know, okay, that needs to get better. That needs to get better. And then going forward, let's see what it see if it does. You know, and uh, we got a good team, man. That's what we can't forget there is it's a good team right it, it's a it's a fun team to watch um yes they get off the slow starts but it's still a fun team to watch you got lonzo on a break throwing oops off the backboard you got you know you got guys getting in the in passing lanes and, and trying to get to the fast break buckets you got zach who can knock down crazy shots you got ddr getting into the mid-range doing his doing his silky smooth stuff and uh, pretty soon, Vooch will be back around, and 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 we'll we'll be all happy as a as a family. So no, let's just <laughs> let's just stay around and 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 uh, and appreciate this this team we 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 have. So yeah, a real team and a living, breathing general manager. <laughs> haven't two things we haven't had in a whole long time. So there it is. Thank you guys. All right, we will see you guys next week. If I can Peace. find the button to shut this thing down. <laughs> 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 Peace. <laughs>